At school, I must admit to not really having a clue as to what I wanted to do with my life. My parents, you ask them, they would always find me on top of the roof, on top of trees, up trees. You know, I was always exploring and enjoyed pushing the boundaries a little bit. I started off when I was 16. My parents booked a trip to Disney World for my sister and myself. Kudos to my father. I said to him, I would rather have the money and buy a motorbike than go overseas. He being quite conservative, actually sat back, also being a philosopher, sat back and thought about this question for a bit and said, all right, you can have a motorbike and not go overseas on condition you go to a spinal unit for six weeks on ward rounds. So that's what I did. And he thought that would have cured me of, um, of ever wanting to ride again. In fact, it really didn't affect my uh, wanting to ride. I'm not sure if I'm a thrill seeker, but I do uh, like adrenaline in sports. He turned to red and are out already. Chris Lett gets a dream start there. Nice to gain ground again on Chris Lett going into turn two. And they go on the inside of Van Rensburg. Wow, yeah, that's pretty impressive stuff there. I once fell off on a corner right in front of my mama there, and that was the last time I think she came to the track for 20 years or something. And in South Africa, you have to do national service. And I got called up just absolutely by chance uh, to the medics. So we did infantry basics, and then we do a medics course in, in the, the army. And I just thought this is just fantastic. By the time I'd finished my national service, I was so um, amped up to do medicine, I went, went and rewrote my trick to get the marks uh, to get into medical school. Yeah, I absolutely love medicine. It was obviously a, a day that is etched in my memory. My son and I, we went to go and watch the racing. And it just so happened that one of the paramedics who I often used to see in the trauma unit uh, at uh, Tigerberg Hospital where I was working was there and we just had a chat. Um, and it was then when somebody came down the mountain and said to me, Alan's fallen off, he's not looking good. We went up the mountain, up a little hill, uh, and found Alan who had obviously gone over the handlebars of, uh, of his bike and landed on his head. And after a lengthy resuscitation that was non, wasn't successful, um, we brought his body back down the mountain. And that's then when it just dawned on me that I can't allow my son to ride uh, and expose himself to this sort of risk, especially if it was a neck injury, which I suspected it was. Of course, we then had to tell his, his wife and his uh, young children, very young children at that stage, you know, it, it sits with you for a while and resonates and then you, you, you attempt to solve the problem. I mean, my first solution was just to look around and find a product. Of course, there wasn't one. And the more I looked, the more I couldn't believe that there wasn't a product. That's when I sort of started working on the whole project to develop the neck brace as it is today. We've always used Alan Selby's name, you know, with his wife and friends and family's blessing. They believe that you know, it wasn't a meaningless passing, you know, that his, his death actually contributed to something significant. And if you look at the statistics today and the clinical statistics, I mean, there's no doubt we have saved a lot of lives and saved a lot of people from wheelchairs. So the first neck brace was made out of foam, plastic and electrical tape. Uh, just to get an overall shape, uh, which I modelled on my father. The second one, where I actually wanted to make a mould so I could make more than one, uh, was modelled on my wife. And I guess it was probably two years before uh, we had a prototype. And particularly in the beginning where there was no standard to test the neck brace around, you have to be very sure in your own mind that what this product is doing uh, is effective A and B is not causing other injuries. In the beginning, we put everything we had into it. I gave up my job and dedicated my, all my time to it. It's quite emotional, actually, because we were burning the candle on so many ends. We were leading a very unhealthy life, and we had an upstairs loft area that we converted to an office. And we would work until 1, 2 o'clock in the morning, go to bed, get the kids off to school, go to work, and so rinse and repeat we raised money from friends and family, and in return for the money we raised, they got shares in the company. Once the, f the friends and family had invested the initial money, we sort of stood on our own two feet and never required uh, funding thereafter.
one morning I woke up and booted up the PC, hundreds of PayPal orders, payments going through, just scrolling, scrolling, scrolling. And I said to Chris, there's a problem. PayPal's malfunctioning. We received a phone call from someone saying, have you seen the David Bailey video? David Bailey, he was a very famous motocross racer in the 80s in the US, very well known. Had a big accident and a thoracic spine injury. So he actually didn't have a neck injury, he had a thoracic spine injury, left him in a wheelchair. We had no idea that he was, he was going to say anything about the neck brace. But what he did is he called out a number of the top riders in the US and said, you really should be wearing this neck brace. Well, our phone didn't stop ringing. That was a whiplash episode. I mean, we... That year, it just was a blur. When we started off with the neck brace, obviously there was no set stand or anything for it. So we, together with some input from, from the BMW, uh, we built a pendulum tester. We've got machines that push and pull and pull things apart. I see the test numbers, I do the testing, I see the improvement a neck brace has on the neck forces. And so how it works is, if I was to fall off a motorcycle, front wheel stops, you hit something, you go over the handlebars, land on your head. Essentially it's the weight of your torso that is loading your neck. If you're wearing a neck brace, what happens is that you land on your head, the, the helmet initially moves out of the path of, of the, the, the impact. So that initial head escape where your head moves is actually very protective to the body. You don't want to constrain the neck completely. Now the flow is ground, helmet, brace, rest of the body, and you bypass the neck in part. In this instance, the, the change in the threshold is by putting the neck brace on and taking some force out of the equation. So force that would have previously put 4,500 newtons of force down your neck is now loading your neck to 2,500 newtons and you don't see the injuries. One of the trickiest things we ever had to get our heads around was integrating our product with everybody else's products. And I think that's what led to our development of, of a range of other products. One of our best sellers now is our body armor. A, because it integrated well with our neck brace, and B, because once again, we didn't look at the status quo in the industry. We didn't say it, a body armor needs to look like this. We said, well, we'll do a soft shell one. We'll use advanced materials that get harder the harder you hit the ground. We're at heart uh, an innovation company, uh, but I think we're now also a, a, a cool brand. When we started making more than just the neck brace, we, we want to really innovate and try and make the best product possible. And sometimes that means looking at a need in the market, uh, for example, goggles or a helmet or gloves or uh, any product category, and say, okay, we know that those products exist. How do we make the best one? It is a, a matter of form follows function because function and safety is always first. We have a small team of industrial designers here that um, basically take care of all the body protection, knee braces. You take ownership of the product. When, when it gets released, it's like your baby going into the, into the wall and you see the reaction of the people. So it's quite a fulfilling uh, job. So I think it's human nature not to want to wear a lot of protective apparel. It adds bulk, it adds weight, it's just other stuff to have to put on. And motorcy most motorcyclists, I think, just want to be free. What's made a big difference for us now is that there are a lot of independent studies. It's not just us saying, this is a good thing. The bicycle market is, is really grown and you get as hurt on a bicycle as you do on a motorcycle. And now because we, we're head to toe, so we make riding apparel from head to toe for bicycles and motorcycles, we now have a women's range. Kudos to our, our marketing and our guys who produce the garments. I mean, they're really cool and stylish. The, the whole company, I think, has metamorphosed from being very, very, very technical to producing really cool apparel that actually is now fashion conscious and brand conscious. And the one interesting thing about our company is that we really have to believe in what we're doing. One of our um, 
uh, rules we live by is that we won't put something on the market and we won't put it in our own children. For more information on the products listed in this video, click on the link in the description area below. Feel free to call us with any questions or place an order at 800-969-7501. Don't forget to smash that like button, comment, share, and subscribe for all of the latest DK events, videos, and promos.